So hello and welcome everyone to this second webinar in the Earth Science Information Partners Data and Action webinar series. My name is Megan Carter and I'm the Community Director of ESIP and I'll be your host for today. This webinar series, which will continue throughout the rest of the year, follows our 2019 theme of increasing the use and value of earth science data and information, which was one of several goals identified in ESIP's most recent strategic plan. ESIP's vision is to be a leader in promoting the collection, stewardship, and reuse of earth science data, information, and knowledge that is responsive to societal needs. ESIP connects people across the data life cycle and across sectors, allowing them to leverage their collective expertise and technical capacity to address challenges related to the creation, management, and distribution, as well as analysis of earth science data. For more than 20 years, ESIP has, ESIP has helped members of the earth science data community find each other across organizations by fostering rich collaborative experiences like meetings and seed funding to further data interoperability. ESIP community members interact through twice annual in-person meetings and through virtual collaborations held throughout the year. Today's webinar will highlight the recent efforts of about half of ESIP's community-driven collaboration areas, including committees, clusters, and working groups. These groups, which you see listed here, increase the use and value of earth science data and information by tackling common data challenges and opportunities. Anyone is invited to participate in these groups, so if you see something here that you're excited about, please don't hesitate to get involved. And I will mention that those that are highlighted in red are the ones that are presenting today. So here's the order for the presentations. Each speaker will have about three minutes to give a brief presentation. If anyone has any questions at any time, please type them into the chat box and we will address them later on in the webinar as time allows. So first off, without any further ado, Let's get started with ESIP Community Fellow Ellie Davis, who will be representing the Agriculture and Climate Cluster. Thank you, Megan. Um, hi, everyone. This is Ellie. As Megan said, I'm a Community Fellow with the Ag and Climate Cluster and also a PhD student at the University of South Carolina in the Department of Geography. And I'll be presenting a variation on our Research Data Alliance poster that's still uh, saying just um, recently presented and this is an overview of our work of our recent work so first uh, the title is how do storytelling soils data standards and research data like life and the research data life cycle have in common and surprise surprise it's the east of agriculture and climate cluster and what you see is two components flowing together the first component is the climate uh, resilience toolkit case studies, which are, if anyone hasn't done them before, it's a brief story highlighting examples of real people or communities who recognize climate related issues and take some action towards building, building resilience. And then the second part is the, our story structure. So this is something that we created, um, paraphrased from Randy Olson and Andy Rubkin, and it has a main character and a goal but an obstacle, and then therefore, and a solution. And keep an eye out for this throughout the rest of the presentation because it will definitely be coming up. Uh, next slide. So those two components flow together and came out as the ESIP CRT workshop. And from there, we identified uh, several main characters. So the agriculture and climate cluster, the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit, the USDA Agriculture Research, Research Service, and the Climate Hubs from the USDA. And those were the Northern Plains Climate Hubs and the Southwest Climate Hubs. And so those went through the ESIP pipeline, but at the same time as identifying the story that we were going to tell, we also had an offshoot, which you can see on the side, which was creating a data to decisions provenance with the ESIP lab project to encode provenance for the selected uh, CRT case study, which is uh, what is on the next slide. So, next slide. so the goal of the story, uh, kind of a climax, if you might 
imagine if you were writing a short story, is this scenario planning to promote resilience in beef production. And so we created uh, this look at, uh, if you can see the image at the top, looking at scenario planning and resilience. And that makes sense when you look at what the obstacle is. So our goal was to create the resilience, and the obstacle is climate change, which is flowing out of the pipe and making things a little bit messy uh, down below. And then, therefore, uh, we had to create a solution, which was to create the CRT uh, case study and to promote open data standards, as you can see, splashing out of the uh, case study that's at the very bottom. And so this is what we've been working on uh, over the last couple of years. And then what came out of that and what's pulling together at the very bottom of the, of the pipeline is that this summer, we will be doing a workshop on soils, data standards, and disasters on, I believe it will be Thursday. Um, and this came from a fall, our, our winter meeting workshop or our winter meeting session on soil standards that was very interesting. And I hope that you all will join us in July to participate in our workshop. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Next up will be Patrick Chandler from the Clean Network. Hey, everyone. Uh, as Megan said, I'm Patrick Chandler, and I'm an ESIP fellow uh, and a PhD student based at the University of Colorado in Boulder, um, working with the Clean Network and based at the Center for Science and Technology Policy. So I'd like to start off by giving you a little background about CLEAN. In 2009, the Climate Literacy Framework was released by the U.S. Global Change Research Program to establish the essential principles of climate science. In response, the Climate Literacy and Energy Awareness Network, CLEAN, was formed to help provide expert review, teaching resources, guidance on how to use those resources, and offer support through a community of practice to help educators and outreach professionals teach those essential principles of climate science. The CLEAN portal was launched in 2010 as a National Science Digital Library Pathways Project. The portal provides access to the CLEAN collection of resources and to the CLEAN network. As new resources have been published, we've continually updated our collection to help educators connect students to the best climate and energy science available. The CLEAN collection has over 700 lessons, curricula, and teaching guides that have been reviewed and determined to be the best resources available from over 30,000 on the web. Next slide, please. The CLEAN Network is a community of practice and includes education directors of science centers and museums, classroom teachers, government and private sector scientists, and many others interested in climate and energy education and outreach. We maintain a listserv that currently has over 600 members and we hold weekly calls on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern time. All calls are recorded and cataloged on the website so you can look through the topics we've covered and browse presentations, even if you're not able to make the calls. We cover a wide range of climate and energy focused topics and welcome presenters who would like to workshop their ideas and receive feedback or offer new tools to our community. You can join the network through the website and please let me know if you're interested in presenting. Uh, next slide, please. As researchers and scientists, I think we often find ourselves presenting to the same groups at the same conferences year after year. The CLEAN community, I think, can help the ESIP community reach new audiences and broaden its impact. If you have a project you're interested in communicating and sharing to the public or to students, it's likely we can help you reach that audience by connecting you to partners in our network. We're also constantly updating the CLEAN collection and we welcome new tools, data sets, and lessons that can help educators teach about climate and energy. And uh, my question for this group is, what databases have you created that might help an educator provide real world based classroom activities for their students? Uh, if you'd like to talk more about those tools or join the network or present for CLEAN, please get a hold of me. And I look forward to seeing you all at the summer meeting. Thanks. That's a great question, Patrick, and hopefully we can get some answers in the chat box or some conversations started um, later on after the presentations. 
So next up, we will have Rupu representing the Community Resilience Cluster. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Rupu Gupta. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm representing the Community Resilience Cluster. We have formed fairly recently. Uh, I believe it was last fall when we um, started conversations. The goal of our cluster is to enhance community resilience through culturally meaningful improvements to data accessibility and informatics tool. The way we define community is both place-based and also organizational. Uh, organizationally, the resilience framework that we use or the definition that we use is that of um, the capacity to anticipate risk, limit impact, and bounce back through survival adaptability, evolution, and growth in the face of change. We have three goals in the long term. Uh, the first is to expand and improve the connections between data, informatics, and community resilience practitioners. The second is to define transdisciplinary knowledge frameworks that help support community resilience. And the third is to explore the role of data in advancing equitable community resilience efforts. Our recent work uh, involves working on a white paper that we hope to publish in the future. This paper builds on an earlier paper some of our members had started to develop, uh, focusing on resilience and how earth science data plays into it. Um, for the new paper that we're working on, we pose a problem statement, which is what is needed right now to make the transition of scientific data information for scientists to scientific data and information for public use. So very much focused on the use aspect. Next slide, please. The other uh, things we are working on include updating our wiki page. Um, we have updated our wiki page to include resources and news about our cluster. That includes information on how to connect with us, including when we have our monthly meetings, which is the third Wednesday of every month. There are also a number of resources and products we are sharing through the wiki page. Um, these are things we've developed, such as previous publications, including the one that I mentioned, on which our current white paper is based, and also uh, the slides uh, from the panel presentation that we did at the most recent winter meeting. So you can access all of those in our wiki page and um, contact us directly to join the email list. We've included the information here, um, and you can feel free to connect with us anyway. The question we pose for the group today is, we're curious about how other clusters have worked with partners, stakeholders, and audiences to ensure that they are using data in meaningful ways. And if you, you. if you want to add to that, please connect with us directly. Thank you. Another great question, and I'd love to keep conversation going in the chat box while we proceed with these presentations. So next up is Matt Mayernick from the Data Stewardship Committee. Great. Thank you, Megan. So um, as, as you said, I'm Matt Mayernick. I'm the past chair of the Data Stewardship Committee. Um, Ruth Doerr is the current chair. She was unable to uh, join this call. So I'm doing a few slides here. The Data Stewardship Committee is a long-running committee um, within ESIP, uh, and we've had a number of activities. Today, I'm going to focus on uh, four topics. There's six listed there on that page. Um, a couple of those, the top two, will be described by other uh, present presenters today. So um, the Citation Cluster and the Information Quality Cluster uh, were kind of spun off from this Data Stewardship Committee in the past, and Mark and Rama will respectively talk about those. So you can go to the next slide, please. So we're going to talk about four projects. Um, Oops. There we go. So the first two here are related to um, understanding data risks um, and uh, potentially assessing those and fixing those. And so starting on the right here with the cats uh, is a project that's um, a couple of ESIP folks, Sophie Howe and Ruth Dewar, are involved in, and uh, as well as folks outside of ESIP. And this is to, um, as it, it says there, to develop a tool which exists now, dataatrisk.org, which would help people nominate um, data sets that they're aware of that may have um, uh, risks that are potentially causing them to be lost or um, unusable. And so I'm not gonna go through the full workflow here, but there's a 
the website provides a process for people to submit data sets that they think are at risk. And then there's a, a kind of a volunteer network of folks who would review those uh, submissions and then um, assess them and potentially mitigate risks if that's possible. So um, that's, a, that's up and running and you're welcome to check it out and submit your own data sets if you have any. On the left is shown a, a project which I'm leading, which is to try to answer questions about how do you assess what data is at risk. And so there's a few questions there. And, and at the bottom, there's a snippet of a matrix. There's a much larger matrix. This is just a snippet that shows um, how you might look at different risk factors across the green there and ways you can categorize them uh, across the, the side. So uh, we're trying to um, couple these projects together. Next slide, please. A couple of other things that I'll mention here, um, which are people in the committee are working on. Um, so Rama is, is working on the ISO preservation content standard. And uh, this is uh, ISO 19165-2, as shown along the bottom. Um, and so this is uh, the next component of a, a first standard, which was 19165-1, which provided fundamentals of preservation of digital data and metadata. And this is now the content standard that provides details on how to um, really flesh things out. And so as, as shown here, there's, this is a culmination of a, a longer term set of activities. And uh, this will be an important document once it's out. It's currently in, re in review. And then on the right is the Data Management Clearinghouse, uh, which Nancy Hobel Heinrich has been leading. And I realize we've got the website, but it's dmtclearinghouse.esipfed.org. And this is a, a source of uh, lots of training materials related to data management, as, as it shows here, over 300 that are categorized in various ways. Um, and there's a, a new activity which Nancy and Carl Benedict are leading to increase that and make the whole system more usable. So if you have training materials, you would like to share, you can uh, submit them there, or if there's um, training materials you'd like to find, that's a great place for that. So again, it's dmtclearinghouse.esipfed.org. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Matt. So next up, we will have Dave Jones of the Disaster Lifecycle Cluster. Hey, Megan, thanks. Uh, this is Dave, and this is a, a great opportunity. Thanks for putting this together to brief the Federation members and and partners on the disaster lifecycle uh, cluster activities, where we like to say the rubber, where the rubber meets the road, that's kind of where we're doing a lot of work. So the overall um, arching, uh, overarching objective of the disaster lifecycle cluster is really to facilitate connections and uh, coordinate efforts among data providers and managers and decision makers, also developers and users of disaster response systems and tools, and end user communities within ESIP. So over the last couple of years, uh, in the upper left-hand corner, we've we've um, focused on trusted data. Uh, what defines trusted data? How can trusted data get uh, assignments of priority? And how can we become a key partner in providing trusted data in a sensitive information sharing environment? So because of our work within the ESIP Federation evolving um, an ESIP member's development of a real-time collaboration environment, we uh, evolved GeoCollaborate through the testbed steps uh, in the Product and Services Committee and worked with the All Hazards Consortium to test out this interface, this mapping environment, dashboard environment um, to emergency managers in the utility industry. And um, you see the UAV SAR and uh, the NASA uh, G3 aircraft image there from uh, looking at um, burn scars and things like that. We're also working with uh, NASA and JPL on uh, taking a look at uh, earthquake vulnerabilities and damage assessments and things like that. So because of our work within the ESIP Federation and evolving, um, uh, evolving all of this activity, we've had huge success and it's actually led to the development of operational readiness levels. You can see on the right-hand side there, um, operational readiness levels for uh, decision makers and this is designed so rapid evaluation uh, framework, this rapid evaluation framework can be put to use uh, and can be a trusted information uh, sort of gauge, if you will, uh, for data sets in geospatial format. And so this has really taken off and we're really pleased to hear that the DHS's National Infrastructure Coordinating Center, uh, their Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency has adopted this approach to quickly identifying and trusting data sets for decision making. And this is really driving data decision driven making, dri uh, uh, data driven decision making. Uh, and we had a great ESIP webinar that was run by uh, Erica 
Vera Ponzi um, as part of the socioeconomic value of data science, of our earth science data. And uh, that series explored the value and benefits of earth science data to bring society together. Uh, uh, so you can find that series on the ESIP website. Next page. Um, so we're working in areas of maturing the ORL framework right now for decision making and disaster applications. Uh, we're also working uh, to get ready for the summer meeting. And the summer meeting's uh, title is uh, uh, identifying trusted data sources for operational decision making and the role of fitness for use as ORL criteria. That's the title of our breakout session uh, that we're planning right now. Karen Moe and I are the co-chairs of the Disaster Lifecycle Cluster, and we hope that uh, uh, you all would like to get involved because we're really dealing with decision makers, and we want to put all this data to use, benefiting not just society, but saving lives and, and property. So you can see the wiki page there. Uh, feel free to send an email to karen.mo uh, at earthlink.net or my, myself, Dave, at stormcenter.com, and we'd like to bring you right into our discussions. We have a lot of... Uh, specifics we're talking about from wildfires to earthquakes to uh, hurricanes, moving fleet utility vehicles across the country so we can get power restored quicker. Um, and uh, now we're talking to the ag and uh, climate uh, cluster so uh, we can see if there's any data sets out there for identifying soil type after wildfires burn. We tend to change the chemical composition of soils and make it much uh, easier for flooding and debris flows to develop once rainstorms move in. So uh, that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dave. Next up is Becky Reed from the Education Committee. And I wanted to check, Becky, are you online? All right, well, we may be missing a speaker right now, so I'm going to wing it. Uh, who is the ESIP Education Committee? So the ESIP Education Committee does a number of great things to promote uh, education. They share data tools via the Out to Lunch webinar series that you may have seen, um, and you can access those. They're really great 10-minute uh, length webinars about data tools. They're very short and informative. Um, they're also trying to bring coding competency to classroom teachers, and this is a big focus of their upcoming uh, data in action teacher workshop that will take place at the ESIP summer meeting um, and bringing um, Jupyter notebooks that have a hurricane activity to educators to share. So they're looking for middle school, high school, um, and community college, I believe, educators to take part in this initiative. And I do know that Patrick, uh, as Patrick mentioned, the Clean Network will be taking part in that activity as well. Um, there are a variety of ways that you can get involved. Of course, there's a wiki page. You can see the Out to Lunch webinar series, and you can learn more about the Data action, in Action Teacher Workshop on our ESIP Summer Meeting Sketch site. So hey, let's uh, go ahead. Can I throw in one thing, Megan? Um, yes, absolutely, Patrick. So I have been uh, working with the Education Committee a lot, and I just want to let folks know that um, if you can help promote this to teachers to join the workshop, there is a, uh, a $200 stipend and a waived registration fee for teachers to help make it accessible to them and uh, get them to Tacoma. And it's a full day workshop of some really great activities. So please help us promote. Thank you. Thank you for that, Patrick. So let's move on to the next speaker, which will be Scotty Strachan from the EnviroSensing Cluster. Okay, uh, hopefully you can hear me there, Megan. Thanks for uh, bringing us up. And so I'm representing the EnviroSensing Cluster. Uh, I believe my co-chair and colleague, Renee Brown, is also on the call, so I'm sure she'll step in if I make any serious mistakes. We are um, an open group of scientists that are generally out at the sharp end of monitoring terrestrial processes. So. We're not really focused on remote sensing, we're focused on in situ, um, on location sensing. And uh, this came out of a group that formed mostly from uh, LTER network and data managers. So um, Corinna Grias and a few other folks uh, were 
really behind this cluster in the very beginning, and it's been a best practices community that uh, has tried to evolve kind of community um, consensus and thinking about the best ways to go about implementing new technologies and how to move science forward. Um, our activities have ranged from tool development to simple collaboration and um, cooperation on projects that are both inside of the cluster and outside. We meet monthly on the first Tuesday at um, 5 p.m. Eastern to Pacific. And we've always been um, very integrative of students. So students have come in, they've done projects associated with the cluster. We've brought them into our um, summer or winter meeting uh, presentation sessions. And um, we've always had very um, motivated and involved student fellows. And we, we thank the ESIP organization for that. And we're really glad to see kind of these younger scientists. Next page, please. So <clears throat> the reason our cluster exists has to do with this revolution in environmental science. So the internet of things, sensor technologies, are really changing how scientists at both small medium um, or even large scales, for example, are approaching uh, environmental research. And <clears throat> there are some real benefits to Internet of Things, but there are also quite a few risks. And the benefits are it's a very inexpensive way to scale your research. Um, you get your data in a digital form immediately. Um, you can run these, of course, unattended, so you're not having to sit there and take notes or make manual measurements. And that means that there's this potential for comparability across projects and even disciplines um, and have uh, be able to develop multiple lines of evidence to support your scientific hypothesis or your observation. The risks have to do with the fact that scientists purchase the device and before they think about management of both the systems and the data, uh, there are multiple modes of error that can be associated with these electronic devices. There's this perception of accuracy when, in fact, the data may or may not be good um, due to both um, incorrect application or installation and long-term degradation of the electronics. And that can mean that the data and the metadata themselves may or may not be well cataloged. They can turn into vaporware. And so we kind of Next page, please. We kind of go across this whole spectrum of end to end from the systems and, and how to connect and, and how to plan your networking in the field for these sensor systems, all the way to we, we want to be thinking about the data quality control issues. So our cluster, um, right now we operate on a alternative guest presenter and internal project discussions in our calls. Um, it doesn't always alternate exactly, but this is the pattern we've been following. We've had a, quite a few people come in from different federal agencies that have been uh, strong participants. So EPA, NOAA, um, USGS, Forest Service. Uh, these are folks that come in, that see value in what we're doing, and um, they continue to, to engage with us. And this has been very good over the years. Um, we've also been performing some outreach to the Australian Research Data Commons. Um, thanks to the, the ESIP organization uh, for getting us hooked up there, and also to the uh, NSF projects like this sensor space project up at Flathead Lake Biological Field Station. So we're interested in organizing both meeting sessions, like we're going to do a, a meeting session here in the ESIP summer, as well as at the national scale. Next year, um, Renee and I are really wanting to do an AGU session on this. So if any of these topics including this awareness of cyber infrastructure and project tool development sounds interesting to you in these applications. Uh, come on in and see what we're doing. And uh, we'll be more than happy to integrate you into our, um, into our cluster. So thanks, Megan and company, for uh, having us. Thank you, Scotty. Moving right along, and uh, just a quick note that there is some good conversation happening in the chat box if you're not watching or if you'd like to contribute. So next up, we have Colin Smith from the Information Management Code Registry. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Hi, folks. Um, so central to enhancing the use and value of Earth science data are good information management practices. And the Information Management Code Registry works to this end by facilitating discovery of software solutions for information management needs. 
Um, our primary goal is to create a comprehensive registry of information management software that is searchable by both task and uh, or software attributes. Um, our secondary goal is to highlight coverage gaps and help shift redundant effort to new development. Um, we focused on three core activities to date and we'll begin two more um, a little bit later this year. Um, first, the registry implementation is complete using EarthCube's Ontosoft platform, a user interface to a rich science software ontology that can be exported in several formats and relate to other science metadata schemas through crosswalks. Um, second, a controlled vocabulary organized around information management tasks is in the alpha uh, release stage. Um, and additional testing and refinement will continue until July when we plan to have a beta release complete um, and we'll carry that forward to the uh, summer meeting and be looking for comments and suggestions then. Um, third, software um, curation is an on ongoing process. So registering software packages in the IMCR is an ongoing process involving a manual search and discovery approach. Today, we've registered 137 software packages each of which is tagged with terms from the controlled vocabulary. And our goal is to really have a good survey of IM software that's available out there in the wild registered in the IMCR by July. Um, fourth, automated metadata maintenance uh, is something that we're keen on developing, and this would decrease workload and ensure packages in the IMCR are um, up to date. And we, we plan to explore um, approaches to handling this um, in July. And finally, highlighting gaps in coverage is valuable for informing development of new information management software packages. So we imagine identifying and communicating these gaps will be partially some automated and manual process. Um, and additionally, we'd like to present uh, view and citation metrics to users to give people some perspective on where the hotspots of activity are or which um, software packages are being used. Um, and this is something we'll begin in July. So uh, we greatly, greatly appreciate any comments, suggestions, or contributions, and of course, welcome any opportunities to support work that you are doing. And um, Stop by the Information Management Code Registry Wiki for onboarding materials and look forward to chatting with you all soon. Thank you very much, Colin. Next up is the Information Quality Cluster and the presenter will be Rama Ramapriyan. Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, my, uh, I, I'm chairing the uh, Information Quality Cluster along with uh, Peng and David, who are both online, and uh, they'll fill in whatever I forget. Okay, oh, I'm hitting my, uh, okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, well, we have a, a very broad vision to become internationally recognized as an authoritative and responsive information source for guiding implementation of data quality standards and best practices. Uh, everywhere for science data systems, data sets, and data and metadata dissemination services. And uh, we, right in the beginning, we have been op operating since 2014 or so fairly actively. And in the beginning, we defined four types of information quality. When we talk about information quality, uh, we talk about what traditionally is thought of as data quality is really science quality. And then uh, product quality is where you're talking about how the scientific products have been put together, such as including the metadata and documentation, etc., and how clear the quality information is for people to understand. And then there is stewardship quality, how well the data are being archived and managed, and service quality, uh, what kind of access capabilities are being provided to uh, uh, get information uh, both about the data sets themselves and the quality information that's contained in the data sets. So there are four types of uh, quality, all of which constitute information quality. 
And what do we do? We share experiences among ourselves. Uh, we collaborate internationally. We have uh, invited speakers at our monthly telecons, which happen on fourth Tuesday of every month at uh, um, 11 o'clock Pacific time, which is two o'clock Eastern time. Uh, and we do have sessions. We have had sessions and papers presented at the AGU and the AMS and ESIP meetings. Um, and talking about collaborating internationally, we've got uh, uh, collaborations with uh, people from Europe as well as Australia at this moment. At the moment, of course, a large percentage of our uh, members are from the um, US. And we maintain a pretty healthy website, website, wiki site with many useful references. Uh, oops, could you go back, please? Thank you. Uh, and we have a number of publications, uh, not a whole lot of them, but uh, given the voluntary type of effort, uh, we have a few publications. Uh, two of them are shown here uh, as published already. And uh, the last one that, I, that is shown uh, Moroni et al. with 22 authors. So that really sp speaks to the great collaboration we have among a lot of people who are spending a little bit of their time uh, and contributing to, to this document called Understanding and Communicating Uncertainty in Earth Science Data Informatics. So this is a white paper in preparation. It's uh, maturing pretty fast this month. Uh, probably by the end of this month, we hope to have a uh, mature enough draft to share. Uh, David is leading it. Uh, so let's go on to the next slide, which is simply a diagram that shows a whole variety of people, many players around the world who are uh, worrying about information quality. And uh, in many cases, we have collaborations with them. That's all I have. Uh, if you have a minute or so, maybe David or Pen can add something. I think we have about 30 seconds if you guys have anything you would like to add. This is Penny. I don't have anything to add. That's an excellent presentation. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. I could probably add real quick as, as we are preparing a, a session to kind of summarize our, our recent activities uh, for the ESIP summer meeting. So thank you. Great. Thank you all. So next we will move on to the machine learning cluster and the community fellow Yuhan Rao will give the presentation. Hi everyone, uh, this is Yuhan Rao from University of Maryland and our machine learning cluster, if it's not at infant stage, will be at toddler stage. We formed from um, August 2018 after the summer meeting um, in 2018. And then once we formed, we had we did a full community survey, and then the survey shows there are two interested like uh, group of people in the ESIP community, and one are interested in the introductory materials, and the other one are interested in those who have experience and seek to share and learn further through the cluster. So with that, our cluster um, has moved towards two tasks. Can you go to next slide, please? And so the first one is um, the curated data sets and the machine learning introductory materials. Myself will be the point of contact who are developing the introductory materials for machine learning uh, algorithms and frameworks, particularly for Earth and uh, Earth and space sciences. And uh, the other group uh, are interested in doing the curated data set, which are developing a repository of data sets that are useful for doing uh, developing the introductory materials for machine learning and also people who are learning machine le learning can use this data sets. And the other uh, activity we have is the intersection with semantics. So as you may know that we will have a, sem a geosemantic symposium uh, together with um, the geosemantic tech committee and which I believe Louis will mention more in the semantic committee um, Thing. And in this uh, symposium, there will be a lot of tagging, labeling, and vocabulary mapping, and other events. And we have great lineup of workshops in the symposium. So everyone are welcome to attend. Next, please. Uh, 
Yes, and so if you're interested in getting involved with our cluster, you can join our existing efforts like developing uh, introductory materials and also if you want to present the things that are relevant and interest uh, to you, you can join our telecom, which is every third Friday, 12 p.m. Eastern time every month. And you, so you can also visit our wiki page for the class or join our listserv. We will have our announcement and the things going on through the listserv. And if you see anything that you're interested in, but not in our current plan, you can help shape the plans and the summer meeting activities now. We are looking for more ideas and speakers for our summer meeting. So if you're interested, please get in contact with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuhan. Next up is the Marine Data Cluster, and we have Jocelyn Elia to present. Hi, everyone. This is Jocelyn. I'm from Florida State University from the Center for Ocean Atmospheric Prediction Studies. And the mission, I'm the chair of the Marine Data Cluster, and the mission for the cluster is to explore critical topic areas in informatics, such as data management, interoperability, data analytics, data quality, and cloud computing, but specifically related to the marine environment. So just to give you a kind of loose definition of what we refer to as the marine environment, we're talking about anywhere in or over water. So in our cluster, we have mostly, for members, we have mostly ocean data managers, but we have some meteorologists who work with shipboard data. We have some software developers. We've had presentations from a hurricane hunter who collects wind data. So we have a, a wide, people from a wide variety of disciplines, and we're not an exclusive group. So if, if any of this interests you, if you're interested in data that's in or around a body of water, uh, welcome. We'd be happy to have you in the cluster. So we have calls every second and fourth Thursday of the month at 1.30 p.m. And usually we try to keep the call on the second Thursday of the month a broad interest call. So it's going to be kind of an introduction to a topic, a topic that hopefully everyone who's interested in marine data can kind of get behind and understand. And then the call on the fourth Thursday of the month, we have our deep dive calls, which are more specialized topics and let us get into kind of the nitty gritty. We might crack open a NetCDF file and look at the metadata, or we might have a more detailed demo. So we try to keep our calls varied in that way. And the cluster started as a group, a grassroots group of ocean data managers at Scripps in March of 2017, but we were formalized within ESIP. We kind of formed at the summer meeting and became a cluster at, or during the fall of 2019. And then our first session was at the winter meeting in 2019. So we did a live poll during our session to determine which focus areas we wanted to, to really hone in on in 2019. And the three different topics are listed here. We have NetCDF CF compliance, best practices for software implementation, and best practices for managing specific marine data types. So you can see the check marks here for the topics that we've covered so far, and we'll keep making our way through this list over the course of 2019. And we try to keep our presentations, our calls, varied within these three main focus areas as well. So we're very excited to work with other collaboration areas. As you can see here, we're interested in a lot of different topics, and a lot of these topics are being um, worked on by other clusters and collaboration areas, so we'd be happy to work with you. And uh, our link to the wiki is there where you can find more information on how to join us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jocelyn. Next up is the Research Objects Citation Cluster and Mark Parsons. Yes, hello everybody. Um, I'm Mark Parsons. Um, I'm a research scientist at Rensselaer Polytechnic, um, although I live in Colorado. <clears throat> um, I think we are the newest cluster, although machine learning and marine are also quite new. Um, so the hence I have the most boring slide. Um, and it actually might help to start with a bit of history. Uh, so an early effort of the Data Stewardship Committee back when it was a cluster about a decade ago was to develop data citation guidelines. Um, and since then, there's been a lot of work in the broader community outside of ESIP around data citation. 
and so we decided that at the last summer meeting that it was time to update those guidelines. And also in parallel, uh, there was a cluster formed to develop software and services citation guidelines, which were just endorsed by ESIP late last year, early this year. Um, Jessica Hausman led, led that group. So we, we spun off as a group, um, just sort of a subgroup of the stewardship committee to update the data citation guidelines and then became more of a formal cluster in recent months, merging with the um, software um, citation cluster to look at all sorts of uh, citation issues. And by citation, we mean both attribution, i.e. credit, and access to the resource. Um, so first, just to note on the data citation guidelines, these have now been approved by the Data Stewardship Committee and the Program Committee, and they will be going out to the uh, East of Assembly on Monday for comment and ultimately voting for an endorsement. Um, <clears throat> I put a link in the chat that if you want to check them out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, basically, the work we did, um, you know, lots actually changed over the last decade um, in terms of data citation practice. Um, so we refined sort of the core concepts that should be included in a citation, um, really putting more emphasis on the persistent identifier than it was in the past. And then one of the things that has been useful in the past and I think will be useful going forward is that we map these concepts. So by concepts, I mean, th mean things like author, uh, repository, title, persistent identifier, et cetera. We map those to a variety of metadata dialects, including ISO 19115, um, good old diff, schema.org, and a variety of them. And that's included as an appendix in the guidelines. We also have more refined guidance on citing dynamic data, data that is you know, changing a lot over time through new versions and new additions, something that we deal with a lot in earth science. Um, in particularly, we recommend the use of the RDA recommendation on di dynamic data citation while recognizing that that can be a big lift for some repositories. So there's some sort of workarounds or short-term hacks that people can do in the future, in the in the short term, at least that help humans resolve the citations. And then we have a whole new section on resolving citations. <clears throat> you know, what happens when you click um, that link or resolve that persistent identifier, especially on how to construct landing pages and make them machine actionable. And we've been working closely, or we've been interfacing at least, with the semantic committee and their work on extensions to schema.org. Um, and that's an ongoing effort. So that's out. Um, hope to have that endorsed soon. And now, having combined with the software and services uh, cluster, we're sort of taking a step back and looking at, you know, what are the things that we are trying to accomplish with data citation or, well, with all sorts of citation, citation of data, software, instruments, uh, algorithms, workflows, uh, broader use of persistent identifiers for things like people and instruments and projects, et cetera. And so we're just getting started. <clears throat> so we've started basically by trying to assess what are all the various concerns that we're trying to address with citation. You know, part of it is to aid reproducibility, part of it is to credit the authors of intellectual resources, part of it is to enable uh, tracking of the use of resources and develop metrics. Um, and so we're trying to understand what are those different concerns that we're really trying to do with um, citation and then what are the sort of research objects that we have in question. And so um, we have started a matrix on basically these research objects and the different purposes that you might want to have for citing them. And then we're going to sort of walk through that to address where we think there are issues, you know, can, can, can we genericize the problem at some level? Or are there specific issues for particular things? We've definitely seen that there's significant differences between data and software citation. There's certain commonalities, but there's certain differences. So we're just getting started. Um, we would welcome your contribution. We now have a wiki page, just went up yesterday. Um, 
I so that's there's not a link in the slide. I'm sorry, but it's off the you know the regular ESIP wiki. Um, and then we'll also have two sessions at the summer meeting. Um, one, we're still very interested in data citation and, and the, 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 the devilish details. You know, we kind of know how to do it at a, at a basic level for relatively static data sets, but it gets more complicated. So we're going to have several presentations from different organizations on how they address those different um, complexities. Um, again, Jessica Hausman is leading that effort. And then we'll also have a session on using citations to develop metrics and how, you know, are data actually being cited? Can we start to develop metrics of data reuse, et cetera? And then finally, I'll note that we submitted an AGU session for this year to really look more sort of uh, at the exploratory side, the research side, um, which we entitled when to cite data and other research objects. And by that, we mean, when in the data life cycle does something get an identifier? At what level of granularity do you assign an identifier to something? Those sorts of questions. So assuming that that is ultimately approved, look, uh, we would encourage you to look at that and submit your experience. Um, Thank you very much, Mark. Oh, and last, last thing we meet, thir third Thursdays of the month, um, 10 o'clock Mountain, noon Eastern. Thanks. Great. All right, we have two more presentations left. There's just a sneak peek at the data citation guidelines that you can now comment on. Uh, next up will be the Semantic Technologies Committee. And Lewis Thanks. McGivney. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Lewis McGivney here, folks. Hello. Um, from sunny Pasadena in Southern California. We are picking up, actually, a theme which is coming out, I think, in a lot of the, the lightning talks from today, which is <clears throat> semantic technologies and data semantics more generally, where my feeling having come into ESIP is that this topic really touches a lot of parts around about the Federation and of course outside the Federation, but it's not something that the committee has done particularly well in engaging around about. So um, what we're really trying to do with the, the semantic technologies committee is get back to being a, te a technologies committee, one of uh, the top level, there's six working groups or committees as top level um, communities within the Federation and, and we're trying to back to the, the core of, of being a technology committee. You'll see at the bottom left here that, um, as was correctly mentioned uh, at the beginning uh, of the machine learning um, out brief, is that we have a geosemantic symposium coming up the day before the ESIP meeting. So it's taking uh, place on the Monday and uh, we'll have a full day of guest presentations in the morning from recognised experts in the field of machine learning and data semantics, and then an afternoon of, of hands-on workshops. So it'd be nice to see, you know, if you're thinking about booking your travel, maybe consider taking your travel a day earlier and, and joining us on that day. There's still um, some places to be filled up. Next slide, please. Okay, great. So getting back to this theme of, of us being a, a technologies committee and essentially uh, delivering on tangible outputs which people can utilise in their projects. Uh, the, the Science on Schema.org project came into the uh, semantic technologies community uh, about, I would say, about maybe six months to nine months, maybe a year ago, and it's been maturing. Um, essentially what scienceonschema.org is, is similar to the bioschemas.org effort. It's extending schema.org essentially for the geosciences, um, in particular enabling you to represent um, in a standardised fashion that's recognised um, across the web your descriptions of your data repositories. For example, I, I'm currently working at the PODAC, the Physical Oceanography um, DAG for NASA, here at Pasadena in JPL, we, we're looking at how to consistently describe the data repositories, as well as the data sets and the catalogues, which are made available through those uh, data repositories. And really what we're looking to try and do is similar to what's been done with the data citations guidelines, as we just heard about. Um, we're looking to propose scienceonschema.org to the ESA programs committee. So a few community members were currently working on that 
And the aim would be that, similar to the data citation guidelines, as we'll be looking eventually for programme committee to review what we've got, what we've put together, um, and hopefully get it out to the Federation for um, further scrutiny um, with the goal, the eventual goal of it being hopefully endorsed. So that's one tangible thing that the committee is, is working on. Can you advance to the next slide, please? You can check out the GitHub link on the bottom there if you're interested. Um, some of these geosemantic symposium, the theme that's been mentioned here is building harmony between data semantics and machine learning. And I think that the, both of these communities within um, ESIP definitely recognise that there's a lot of a lot of work to be done. Um, the, the keyword here being harmony is that the, there's a lot of interesting work going on across the Federation. And I think hopefully we'll provide a full day for us to try and um, align on, on where that harmony really is. So we've got, as I said, presentations in the morning and in the afternoon we'll be hearing from hands-on workshops from Amazon Red Services, Esri, uh, Microsoft, um, and actually the closing um, session of the workshops in the afternoon will be we're pulling in the drone cluster and we're having a drone data API kind of design session and there's going to be more on that throughout the week. Um, advance please. By the way, just very quickly on the workshop, it's free to register. Um, so as I said, if you're planning your travel, then um, maybe consider uh, coming the day before. So anyway, 15 seconds, I apologise. No bother, no problem. AGU workshops, um, we're advancing the scienceonschema.org through AGU. So if you're planning to attend an AGU and you're interested in this stuff, maybe consider registering for the upcoming workshop. Again, that will be free to attend. And we're having a community ontology engineering workshop at AGU coming up as well. So keep your eyes peeled for that. I think that's me. I'll hand it back. Megan, thank you. Thank you, Lewis. Last but very much not least is Sophie Howe from the Usability Cluster. Thanks, Megan. Hi, everybody. I'm Sophie Howe. I am with the National Center for Atmosphere Research, or NCAR. I have been the co-chair of the Usability Cluster with Madison Lane Seth from the USGS for the last two years. We've also worked with Connor Scully Ellison as our fellow last year, which was a wonderful experience. Um, but it's really important for me to know that the cluster is actually in hibernation mode at the moment. This means that we're not meeting regularly on the on a monthly basis, but we are still collaborating with the ESOP community on a case by case basis. Um, I am personally still working with many projects within the community to get, provide them with usability consultation or support. Um, but as a group, um, the members are still very interested in knowing if there's a need for us to start the monthly meetings again. And just as a background, for the last two years, the cluster's goal has been to foster the adoption of usability research and evaluation techniques for human-facing capabilities provided by data services. What this means is that we want to help data services to be useful by having the necessary features and by making those features user-friendly. And both those steps require a lot of evaluations, a lot of planning, a lot of um, uh, iterations, and uh, that's what the cluster has been helping the community to do. While we were meeting regularly, we provided three major services to the community. First, we build a usability test framework. This framework is available still on our wiki, um, which is still accessible. This is a toolkit that helps a project team to start the user study evaluation technique um, if, they've never, if they have never done it before or they just need a, a refresher course. We also gave many presentations to discuss different usability techniques and how to apply them during the data service development cycle. Um, we also provided consultations and uh, actual testing for the services that are being developed or are in, in, in use. We want to continue to help our community to put data in action, and we believe by providing useful data and data services is a key to increase the use and value of earth science data and information. For example, this summer at the summer eating uh, at the summer meeting, <laughs> there is a collaborative session uh, that I will be leading in con in collaboration with the data at risk group that Matt has mentioned earlier um, when he was going over the activities for the data stewardship committee. 
And we will be applying three different usability techniques to improve the group's user experience design and its challenges. There are many other areas we can still work on, um, but as we are the usability cluster, we would like to define uh, the value of and the goals that we can contribute and want to continue to stay useful to the community. And so our questions are, do you have usability needs? And should the cluster stay in hibernation? Uh, we would love to hear from you. We would love to collaborate. We love to continue to promote the usefulness of our services or the data, in, uh, data and its services in general. And so please, please get in touch. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Sophie, and thank you to everybody who presented today. This was really wonderful. The exchange of information in the chat box is just great, and I have the sense that there are quite a few discussions that need to be continued uh, past this webinar. Um, unfortunately, we don't really have time for questions. Uh, I'm trying to stick to our strict one-hour uh, time slot at the moment. Um, but don't despair. If you have questions for each other, please feel free to, to share them with me or we can find other ways to continue this conversation, uh, maybe on a, a Slack channel um, or at the next Collaboration Area Updates uh, Highlights webinar. So just a few closing slides. Um, I want to remind everyone that the next Data in Action webinar uh, will be next month on Friday, May 17th at 1 p.m. And that will be about the fourth national climate assessment. Yeah, we will have a panel of speakers who will discuss how the NCA4 was developed, including what standards of transparency and traceability were used um, and how the NCA4 is being used now to engage with communities and to inform decision making. There are, of course, a lot of ways that you can start to or continue in most of your cases to stay involved in ESIP. Of course, the obvious one is to engage in one of the collaborations that you saw today. You can also encourage your organization to become a partner. And if you have any questions about what that means, um, there's a lot of information on our website. And of course, you can always contact us. You can tell others about ESIP using this URL on the bottom right corner, which is a link to a great one pager that we often share with people who don't know anything about ESIP. And to receive a once weekly update about all things ESIP and ESIP related, you can join our Monday update mailing list using this ePearl link at the top. Of course, as most of you know, um, the 2019 ESIP summer meeting is quickly approaching. I think we're down to 80 something days now until it takes place in Tacoma, Washington in July. And we're currently accepting ideas for workshops, breakout sessions, posters, and more. There's one week. I strategically planned this uh, session for today so that there's still one week left um, before a session submission deadline. So keep the great ideas coming. There are also a number of exciting events that are happening in conjunction with the meeting. Most were mentioned today, the Geosemantics Symposium, the Data in Action Teacher Workshop, and the Drone Data API ha Hackathon, just to name a few. So there are many reasons to join us if you can. So that brings our webinar today to a close. I want to thank our speakers again and everyone else who attended. Uh, we hope to see you for the next webinar on May 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Megan. Thank Bye, you, guys. Megan. Yeah, thank Bye. you. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Everyone.